So it's not much fun being invited to give the first talk on the last day of any meeting. And at my meetings, where people tend to stay up until about 3 a.m., it's perhaps even worse. But I, um, uh, you know, I, I congratulate all of you for having made it here. And you certainly will not be disappointed. The, um, uh, the, the, the way one does this, such things, of course, is to put a speaker on at that time who is absolutely unmissable. And um, as you heard briefly last night from me when we gave Steve the um, Enduring Contribution Award um, at the Guys Dinner, uh, uh, Steve is definitely the kind of person that you can't miss. So please come up. Well, thank you, Aubrey. Any time I come to a meeting that's organized by Aubrey, I feel that I have to be provocative. So I'm going to do my best to be provocative today. Oops. Yes, let me start off. By the way, anybody know what that is? Any New Zealanders here? That's a tuatara. Lives over 100 years. So let's, let me start off this way. Um, nature is smarter than you are. And by you, I, I mean the collective you, or as we would say in the American uh, South, uh, evolution is smarter than y'all. Um, and by that, I mean that it's had billions of years and billions of combinations of ways to try to overcome the inherently destructive processes of aging. Now, I'm showing you two pictures up there. One of them is uh, a, young, a young person trying to do a cartwheel, not doing a very good job, as, as you can see. And my guess is that any of us, if we were asked to help that person do a better cartwheel, we could do it. So that person would be very easy to uh, improve. Uh, Simone Biles, on the other hand, would not be so easy to improve her cartwheels. She's absolutely excellent, of course. Now, I make that point because it's easy to forget that mice are very, very inept at aging. They're terrible at aging. And we humans are very, very good. We are the longest lived terrestrial mammal. Mice are shorter lived and age more quickly than over 99% of all of the vertebrate species on the planet, which means that it's easy to make a mouse live longer. Making a human live longer is a whole different story because we already age so exquisitely well. However, there are species that battle the, the degenerative processes of aging better than humans do. Maybe not in every aspect, but certainly in some aspects. And it's those species uh, that I call Methuselah Zoo. And um, you're gonna hear about some of them this morning, uh, fascinating stuff. I'll just give you, there, there's a few species that in their absolute age live longer than humans. And, but there's another group of species that don't live longer in absolute years, but if you calculate their age according to their size or according to their total metabolism, they also live longer than humans. So that's the species that I think we're gonna learn the most from. I think that the model species are great for pointing us in some correct directions, but I think creative solutions, the ones that evolution has had billions of years to create, are going to be the ones that really launch us into a brand new way of experiencing aging. Uh, let me just briefly talk about body size because I think it's important because to a comparative zoologist like myself, biology size is probably the first thing I'd want to know about a, about a new species because it basically affects virtually every aspect of their biology. And I've just got a list of things here that body size affects and most of those things are also affected by aging and, and affect aging. So looking at animals, that for their size live longer than people is something that I think we ought to do a lot more of, and that's what you're gonna hear for the rest of this uh, seminar. Now, of all the groups that I've advocated for over the years that we ought to be focusing some attention on, 
Some of them are now getting the attention. You know, Emma Teeling is doing all this wonderful stuff uh, with bats, and, and, and Vera and Andre are doing these things with all kinds of organisms. One group that hasn't really caught on is a group I want to talk about today because I think it's time for it to catch on. I'm going to make the case that we ought to spend more time uh, doing research on this one group. So I'm going to call it the most overlooked uh, group of uh, animals in Methuselah Zoo. Uh, and here they are. So this is a bird called uh, the northern fulmar. Uh, if you're not a bird expert, um, that looks a lot like a seagull. It is a lot like a seagull, but if you saw it fly, it would be different. And that's an ornithologist named George Dunnett who started uh, a study in 1951 on some islands off the coast of Scotland. He was 23 at the time. Um, 42 years later, 41 years later, um, here's George again. Uh, as you can see, George has changed a bit. No longer looks like he could bounce over the rocks of the island that he works on. Uh, and that's the same bird. Um, that bird is still reproducing. I don't know about George at this point, but my suspicion is he probably is not. Now, about a year later, George died. And so I waited a reasonable amount of time. Um, and then I contacted the person that took over his study. And I said, yeah, what's going on with that bird? Is that bird still around? And that bird did outlive George uh, for quite some time. Now, that's an exceptionally long bird, but a long life bird, but it's not the most exceptional. Every bird, every dicky bird that you see flying around here, the pigeons, the ones lying in the trees, those are all much, much longer lived than a similar sized mammal. Here's one other I, I can't resist mentioning. This is a Lysen albatross, and this is an ornithologist that's got a great uh, ornithologist name. His name's Charlie Robbins. Uh, and Charlie uh, actually put a band on that bird in, uh, what does it say, in the early 1950s, I think 1953. And that bird at that point was about at least five years old because it was, it was uh, incubating an egg, and they don't reach uh, adulthood until they're at least five years old. So it was at least five years old. Um, Charlie was 38 years old at the time, and Charlie lived to be 98 years old and just died, I think, 2018 or 2019. That's the same bird, and that's last year. So that bird, uh, it's got a name, because if you live that long, you get a name if you're a bird. It's a bird called Wisdom. And it's the longest live wild bird that we know of. In fact, it's, uh, I, I'm not sure that there are any wild mammals that we could say for sure, terrestrial mammals, except for, well, I guess there's an there's a elephant age that's, that's pretty well validated, about 80. Now, it's not that longevity per se that makes the bird so interesting. A lot of it has to do with the fact that they stay healthy right to the end. Wisdom is still fledging young, and that may sound really easy, except for the fact that they have to fly thousands of miles to get food to feed their young every year. And the other thing that makes this group unique, and the reason that I think they'd be particularly interesting to study, because I think they probably age slowly in a different way than most of us, is they have a constellation of traits that if I just told you what those traits were, and I said, okay, is this a long-lived or a short-lived group? I think almost everybody in this room would say, oh, they have to be short-lived. So what is that? Um, first of all, birds have a higher metabolic rate than we do. Um, that's not surprising, given the, the physical demands of flight. You know, the, the common passerines that you see around here will flap their wings four or five times uh, a second when they're flying. There are some birds that can do that for a week straight without stopping and can migrate 1,300 kilometers without ever landing, without ever eating, without ever drinking. So they have a high metabolic rate, which everything else being equal, you'd expect, well, that should make them uh, shorter lived. The difference in their longevity, by the way, is gross underestimate of what it truly is. And that's because virtually all of the data from birds come from field collections of birds, and virtually all the examples of mammals, the exception of bats and, and whales, come from captive animals. 
And as you'll see, the difference between captive and wild animals can be quite dramatic. The other thing they have is they have a higher body temperature, and it's substantially higher. It's high enough. I actually had a, a, a body temperature of 41 degrees when I had malaria, and I can tell you it's not something that you're going to survive if you have her. They have a higher body temperature. Now, that should accelerate all kinds of chemical processes. It should accelerate the formation, formation of advanced glycation end products, because uh, non-enzymatic, all it takes is heat and sugar for that to happen, which brings up the third point that they have. They have, besides the metabolic rate and the, and the uh, body temperature, is they have higher blood glucose to support the great energy demands they have. They have levels of blood glucose that would be diabetic if they were in a human, yet they don't damage all of their vessels. So they've got protective mechanisms that are very, very, against some of the things that are clearly quite closely involved in human aging. So I think for those reasons, this is a particularly interesting group. The other thing that's nice about them is that we know a lot uh, uh, about how to take care of them. So summarizing what I just said there, faster metabolism, higher body temperature, higher concentration of blood glucose. And again, you would expect that to lead to faster aging, but in fact, no, nope, slower, slower aging. And so I'm going to suggest one approach to doing this here. And, and that's to compare this feeble creature here um, with only lives a year in the wild. By the way, for those of you who study mice and, and you think of mice as being old at, at two or two and a half years, in the wild, uh, the mean longevity of mice is about three to four months. 90% longevity is at six months, and the oldest ones live just a bit more than a year, and that's from samples of hundreds of individuals. Um, where is it? The most common bird in the world, which is a house sparrow, which we have in the States and you have here and everybody has everywhere, um, can live up to 20 years in the wild. And we have no idea how long they could live in the lab, but they're very easy to keep in a small aviary. So this would be a nice sort of two species comparison to start off with. And I'd really like to see somebody get into this and discover the secret of how something that's the size of a mouse but has a faster metabolism, more higher blood glucose and higher body temperature manages to survive so much longer. But now, and this part of my talk came about because of what I heard earlier in, the, uh, in, the, in this meeting, and I wanted to make sure that I talked about it because I've been thinking a lot about it lately. There's a second overlooked but informative species, and you're seeing it right here. Uh, There's actually two species. I think of it as two species. One of them on the left there is a wild mouse, what I think of as a real mouse. Uh, the ones on the right are pet store mice, you know, sort of randomly bred and, you know, in barns and, and, you know, thrown random amounts of food. And I think we have a great deal to learn from both of those, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. We really have reached a point in this field, and this became apparent over the last few days, if you're listening, that we're ready to move things into the clinic, and things are starting to move already into the clinic, and that's very different. The first 20 years that I was in the field, the only thing we had was dietary restriction, which a shrinkingly small fraction of people could do, and we didn't even know if they were doing themselves good or not. But now we have at least a half dozen really promising avenues for impacting human aging. But a dirty little secret is how often clinical trials that come from preclinical models fail. Uh, historically, these are the figures. Cancer trials fail about 92 to 95% of the time from the people that have actually gone through and counted them up. And that's actually the most successful of the clinical trials of the major diseases that kill us. Uh, stroke, um, 99, over 99% of the clinical trial, uh, pre, the clinical trials from preclinical pre uh, evidence fail and uh, it's way over 99% for Alzheimer's disease. Now, we don't know what it's going to be for geroscience, and, and, and Brian Kennedy made the, the comment yesterday that mice don't typically get stroke 
Alzheimer's disease. We've had to genetically bash them about quite a bit to create these very artificial conditions, and that might be why the translatability is, is so low, and that's true. And, and, but mice do age, so maybe it'll be higher for geroscience, but maybe it won't. And I can't think of anything else in science that has this degree of failure, yet doesn't change. Because preclinical intervention trials have been exactly done exactly the same way for decades. The only thing that's changed is in the 70s when we suddenly decided we had to get uh, the pathogens out, so we started using SPF facilities. And then in the, in the 90s and the 2000s when we were forced to really add females to the collection. And those are both changes, some of which are good, some of which are not so good, and let me explain that here. So I think there's two reasons for this high degree of failure, and Aubrey was complaining about how costly his mouse study uh, was uh, yesterday, but it's not costly at all compared to a human trial, clinical trial. So if, if you could get this level of failure from 90 plus percent to even 50 percent, it would save billions and billions and billions of dollars. Now why do they fail? I think there's two reasons. I think one is the species, must musculus. Uh, I, I don't have anything against that as a species except for the fact that it's one species. That's the main thing I have against it. Well, actually, that's not true. I have several other things against it. I'll tell you what those are. Um, it's not only one species, but it's a species that does such a bad job at aging that actually making it do slightly better is easy. And I'm not sure that we're learning much at all about how to make humans age better if we only look at that. So, but the other thing is that all species have idiosyncrasies. We certainly have our idiosyncrasies. Alzheimer's disease is a huge idiosyncrasy of humans. It's not clear that any other species get anything like Alzheimer's disease. And mice have their idiosyncrasies as well, but it's very difficult to pick out exactly what the idiosyncrasies are as long as you only have one species. Now we've taken that species and we've inbred it and domesticated it uh, and that's enhanced the idiosyncrasies. Um, and then the point that I'm really going to focus on for the rest of the talk is the standard laboratory environment has also enhanced the idiosyncrasies and I think that's something that we need to seriously consider uh, changing. So um, what about the environment? First of all, um, I think we ought to have a second species, and the second species that I'm advocating is for rats, which we talked about a little bit. But let's just talk about the environment, because this is something that, that um, I think is really important. And if you've grown up, so I grew up you know, as a field biologist, and so I have a completely different way of thinking about animals. If you've grown up in a laboratory environment, I'm not sure you appreciate how bizarre it is. So first of all, it never changes. You know, the lights go on, the lights go off the same time every day. It's cold, it's too cold, the mice are cold all the time, they're slightly cold stressed all the time, and that's so the laboratory personnel. It's microbiologically depauperate, and that's on purpose. We made SPF uh, facilities so that we could have greater replicability of the experiments that we did, and there's certainly something to be said of that, and that's a big thing in the NIH now. Uh, it's, it's not stimulating in any sensory sense. There's very little in the way of enrichment, um, and that makes a difference. And uh, it's completely unlike the richness of our environment or our pet's environment or the environment of a real world. I was talking to Fernando Notabam about birds uh, a few years ago, and he's the one that discovered neurogenesis, and he discovered it first in, in canaries, in laboratory canaries. And one of the things that he told me was when he looked at neurogenesis in wild birds, the, this is uh, new neurons in the brain, that it was more than 20-fold higher than any of his laboratory animals, and he thought it was because of the stimulation that they got. So there's an important distinction that, that clinical trial aficionados make, and it's this. There are two types, basically. These are, it's a continuum, but there are two extreme types. Well, first of all, there are explanatory trials, which evaluate an intervention under very specific, narrow conditions with the idea that this is best for evaluating mechanisms and for replicating experiments. And I think we don't have a good enough uh, 
culture of replication in this field. And so there's a certain place that that comes in. Uh, there's another kind of trial, though, and this is the kind of trial that you usually have. This is, a, this, is a, this is a stage three trial, and that's called a pragmatic trial, and that uh, evaluates an intervention under real-world conditions, not just in the hospital, but in the, in the community, among people of various social statuses, various dietary habits, various health habits. This is the advantage of the explanatory trials, is you can make things very, very consistent. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the interventions testing program, and this is for them. And what you can see on the left there is three survival curves that were done at three different institutions. Now that, friends, is hard to do. If you've got that kind of similar survival curve doing it twice in your own institution, it would be remarkable. But they do this time after time after time. They're outstanding. So when they find a result, like this, uh, what is this, this is a 17 alpha estradiol result, it's a result that you can take to the bank because basically it's been done once and replicated twice by the time they do it. That's the huge advantage of explanatory trials and of standardizing everything. But like I say, people do not live in standardized cages. We have all kinds of things. We're genetically diverse. We're economically and socially and environmentally diverse. <clears throat> and my world was shook a few months ago when I was at a conference, and I found this out. So these are uh, pet store mice. And the graph there is from a paper that was published on the effect of senolytics on COVID-19. And what that graph showed, and I, I had read the paper, but I hadn't thought about the graph. What that graph showed is if you take your black six mice and you put them in a cage that previously held pet store mice, and these are not sick pet store mice, these are just average pet store mice, they're all dead in two weeks. And that, that shows you that there. Now these were 20 month old, so these were older, roughly 60 year old mice, but still it's quite remarkable. It's only the bedding of seemingly healthy pet store mice. That suggests that our mice are very fragile. And uh, the mo it was partially rescued by the senolytic, which was you know, the essence of the paper. But to me, it was the fact that perfectly healthy pet store mice exposed to seemingly healthy uh, laboratory mice, they kill them. And so I actually started investigating. There's a pretty big literature on this. And I started thinking about what if we just switch the environment around a bit? And so here's one non-standard thing. This is Huntington's disease mice. So this is a genetic model, right? We know the genes that cause Huntington's disease. We can put it into mice. We can get many of the same symptoms. And that's a graph in two set, uh, of two conditions and when the disease first appeared and the fraction of mice it appeared in. The only difference between those is that in one of them, there were a few tubes and tunnels and toys. And that made that huge difference like that. That's not a one-off. Here's a provocative case that I came across re recently that I, I think is worth noting. 2006, there was a clinical trial of a monoclonal antibody that had been developed as a treatment for lymphocytic leukemia and rheumatoid arthritis. And it had gone through all the established preclinical testing and everything had been fine. The first six people that they injected it to had a horrific, they, they all came close to dying. They had a horrific cytokine storm, multiple organ failure. Fortunately, with heroic work, uh, none of them ended up dying, but a couple of them ended up really seriously bad. And it had passed the preclinical trials with no problem at all. Now, what happened just a couple of years ago is they redid this with mice. But these were mice that were called wildling mice. These are mice that had actually, uh, they were C57 mice, but instead of being uh, bred in the uterus of another SPF C57 mice, they'd had their embryos implanted in a wild mouse, and they'd been delivered by a, a wild mouse. And just that simple thing, they went through exactly the same kind of cytokine storm uh, that the people went through. So that's how you make the wildling mice. Uh, here's another one. Here, here's, this, again, pet store versus laboratory mice. 
Uh, these are the numbers of dif differentiated uh, T cells. Um, and you can see the laboratory mice had very few cells compared to an adult human. In fact, the laboratory mice immune system looked very much like a neonatal immune system. That's because they haven't had normal environment, microbiological experience, not exposure to pathogen, but uh, uh, basically being separated from any kind of microbiological experience. Um, um, here's what it, looks, what it looks like inside the female reproductive tract. And here you can see the comparison with a pet store mouse. Again, these are healthy pet store mice, but they've been just exposed to things over the course of their lives. Um, when you do that, if you take young mice and you do it, you still get about 20% of them that die. So here they co-housed C57 black mouse with pet store mice, but young ones, about 20% died, but the rest developed a normal mouse uh, immune system. And you can see the difference in the number of uh, of differentiated T cells there in the different organs. Now, I think this is important because if you think of what the immune system affects, your immune system affects your microbiome and vice versa, of course. It affects the sterile inflammation that we know now is a part of aging. Uh, it affects the microbiome. It affects cancer surveillance. It affects whether senescent cells are cleared or not pretty much every aspect of biology. And it's not just the microbiological exposure that makes the immune system better. There's things about the light-dark cycle, the temperature, uh, the exercise capability. So I think we need to really rethink the way that we do it. And here's one last example. This is an example that Rich Miller pointed out to me years ago, and he misinterpreted it, and I misinterpreted it at the same time. So let me reinterpret it now. So this is a mouse on the left there that was presented in the 1970s as a model of accelerated aging. And you can see why. It lived just a few months. You know, it lost subcutaneous fat. Its immune system collapsed. It got cataracts, the kind of thing that we would say, oh, that's a progeroid mouse. Uh, years later, it turns out that the same mouse kept in clean conditions at the Jackson lab was a Snell dwarf, one of the mice that's an example of extended longevity. They lived 25% longer than the controls. Now, the way that that was interpreted by Rich, and he kind of convinced me, was that this shows the importance of having an absolutely pristine, healthy environment in the lab. Because if you don't, you can have something that goes from a model of delayed aging to a model of accelerated aging. I think the better interpretation, the way I'm thinking of this now, is what is there about this mice, mouse that makes it so sensitive to different environments that it can flip from being exceptionally long life to being exceptionally fast aging with some simple environmental change. We don't know what that was. So I'm for pragmatic trials. I think that once we get to the point where we're doing uh, clinical trials, the last preclinical trials probably ought to involve a couple of species. Toxicology uh, testing has to involve a couple of species, multiple genotypes, more realistic environments, and multiple environments. So I'll just stop there, uh, plug my book. Thanks for Audrey for plugging it and these nice things that all my relatives said under pseudonyms of, about it. So thanks for your attention. Lovely, lovely, lovely stuff, Steve. Um, and honestly, you know, I, those of you who were successful in struggling out of bed um, this morning, I'm, I'm sure you can see that you made the right decision. Uh, and Steve has even been so generous as to give a few minutes for questions. So hands up, everybody. Uh, there you go. Uh, who's got the microphone? Who's got the, the, the volunteers with the roving microphones? Did not succeed in getting out of bed. Uh, um, OK, they're coming. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank See, you. She's the chair of my board of directors, and that's, uh, that, uh, that's very cool. Yep. Good. So uh, thank you. This was a fascinating presentation. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about 
uh, given the implications of the variations in environment on the lifespans of mice and other organisms, what could be said from a scientific standpoint about the implications of variations in environment on human longevity and the kinds of environments that we would thrive better in and what sort of difference could that make to our life expectancies? Or on the other hand, have we essentially evolved such exceptional longevity already that the environment wouldn't make that much of a difference? Um, you, you please. Yeah, ex excellent question. I think it's still important to us. I think uh, it, it's, you know, we certainly have improved, we've made our environment more friendly to ourselves, but all you need to do is have something like COVID-19 pop up to show you how much we're still at the mercy of our environments. And I also notice that there's this huge disparity in many diseases, particularly neurodegenerative diseases. And, and, and we now know that continuous cognitive stimulation is very, very good. We know exercise is even good for neurodegenerative diseases. So we can only do much, so much with a kind of passive environment, but there's also the, well, how we interact with the environment that I think is really important as well. Behind you. Steve, about these birds, do you think they've got one genetic secret which gives all of them this enhanced longevity, or do you think if we study birds more carefully we might find many possible genetic mechanisms? I, I would suspect many. Um, I mean, aging is complex. If it were, you know, if it were one or a few genes, we would have it figured out now. Any more questions? Yes, right, right over there. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk, and I've been a big uh, kind of supporter of that mixed environment for mice. If, if you look at an aging model, well, an aging disease, ataxia telentasia mutated, you know, when they first made those knockout mice, they didn't replicate disease. And then once a PhD student came in, going, it's worked, the, the Purkinje cells are dying. And what they actually found was they'd actually moved their mice from their study into an ante room, which was on a different air conditioning system. So they found out you needed exposure. My, my question, though, is what, what is the evolutionary pressures you think that drive longevity in subspecies and brevity in others? Um, I think it's mainly driven by the friendliness of the environment, that friendlier environments, a lot, because haphazard deaths are less likely to happen. I, you know, <clears throat> for years and years and years, it was, it, it was standard in the field to say, Extrinsic mortality is the key. In low extrinsic mortality environments, you can expect the evolution of long life. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. It has uh, aspects of other parts of longevity, but certainly if you look at where the longest live species live, they either live in areas that have a low level of sort of accidental mortality, or they have some aspect of their biology, like a shell, or spines or something that protects them. And that just gives the opportunity for selection to operate, to slow down everything, to have higher quality, fewer higher quality offspring. And, and you know, it doesn't make any sense to have an immune system that's gonna last 50 years if you're likely to be killed by a hawk in the next three years. So I think that's best I can do. Oh, thank you, Steve. A great talk, as always. I have a sort of more pragmatic concern, which is, of course, it would be fantastic to do, you know, uh, studies of uh, longevity in mice in a field, uh, but, but I, I imagine it, it's prohibitively expensive. I mean, you heard Aubrey say yesterday they didn't include a running wheel because it was expensive. So what do you think would be a, perhaps a reasonable compromise or what do you think would be an acceptable improvement in the conditions of mouse for longevity studies? Well, um, first of all, yeah, that's an yeah. excellent we, 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 question, yeah. Um, I, I don't think you need to raise them in a field. I, but I think we need to have two types of mouse studies. I think we need to have the ones that are really preclinical interventions, ones that we really want to be the ultimate step before we moved into clinical trials. Those, I think, ought to be done with plenty of enrichment, with multiple genotypes, with, with all kinds of backgrounds. I would have 
pet store mice. I would have some mice, you know, that were uh, in rooms of different temperatures or moving. I don't think it needs to be perfect. I don't think we're trying to replicate, but I think the more variety that you have in the circumstances under which, and what you're looking for, of course, is for your intervention to work in all of those environments. If it only works in one environment, then that's telling you something about the possibilities of what happens when you move it into the clinic. And again, you may think that this adds a lot to a mouse study, but a, you know, near Barcelize TAME study, which is a pretty small clinical trial, it comes in at $66 million. So that's a lot of mouse studies. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, round of applause. Yeah, that, was, that was everything I was hoping it would be.